Good morning. I'm Raymond Richard Neutra, Richard Neutra's youngest son, and we're here today with uh, Brad Traver, who is the former superintendent of the Petrified Forest National Park and was responsible for the beginning of the restoration of the Painted Desert Community Complex that uh, my father, Richard Neutra, and his partner, Robert Alexander, designed. Um, and so Brad has kindly agreed to tell us the story of the beginning of that complex and uh, the beginning of the restoration of it and will tell us a little bit about its possible future. Brad, thank you so much for doing this work. Raymond, I'm, I really appreciate your asking me to do it and uh, I'm, I, I feel strongly about the rehab of this complex so I'm looking forward to telling everyone who visits this website what it's all about. Uh, so the presentation will be uh, what the Painted Desert Community Complex is uh, for those who uh, don't know much about it, and then uh, what we have done to, to get the restoration started. Um, again, my name is Brad Traver. I was a superintendent of the park from 2011 to 2019. Uh, and so let's learn something about the community complex. Pet Petrified Forest National Park uh, was established um, in 1906 as a, as a national monument by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, primarily for the petrified wood at the very south end of the park. It started at the south end and grew over time to reach the transportation corridors to the north. So this photograph is taken in one of the petrified wood deposits uh, that are scattered across the south part of the park. And then this is the painted desert portion that is the northern portion of the park that was added later. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Mission 66 was a significant landmark in the history of the National Park Service because it was a reconstruction effort nationwide to bring the standards of the facilities and parks uh, up after the post-war boom in visitation uh, revealed how poorly they were uh, developed. So the, the goal of the program, this is this poster is from the petrified forest uh, version of Mission 66. So there were several things that were happening um, at the park we'll talk about in just a second, but park facilities built during the depression and the CCC era uh, by the 50s were undersized and beginning to be run down. Uh, they were generally rustic uh, and architecture had moved to a new modern phase, um, embracing the interface between uh, structures and nature in a much different way than, than the rustic style uh, that uh, parks were used to. Uh, and Mission 66 also introduced the concept of the visitor center. There were 109 of them planned nationwide in this program. It was a, it was a billion dollar program uh, for construction across the country roads, parking lots, picnic facilities, housing, maintenance facilities, all kinds of different things were included in the program. At Petrified Forest, uh, there was a large boundary expansion, as I mentioned, uh, reaching from the south to the north in order to connect the park to the transportation corridors. At the time, it was Route 66, uh, and, and the Interstate 40 was just being constructed. Uh, so the, the expansion of the park was a big deal. Park status came in 1962 after the Painted Desert portion of the park had been added. Uh, there was an addition proposed to the Rainbow Forest Museum, which is at the south end of the park where petrified wood deposits are. Uh, picnic areas, uh, shade shelters at various trails, roads, trails, and then of course the big part of Mission 66 at Petrified Forest was the Painted Desert Community Complex. This project was one of the most bold projects, one of the boldest projects 
in the entire Mission 66 program. And it was bold for a variety of reasons. It was bold because it was ambitious. It included all of the various functions that were needed to run a national park all in one complex. It's the only time that I'm aware of that that's been done in the Park Service, uh, which means there was housing, there was public services, there were offices, there were maintenance facilities, there were even community facilities for, for employees who lived there. It was everything. Everything that was needed to run a park was in this complex. Uh, the choice of Neuter and Alexander was also bold because it ensured that there was going to be a full embrace of modern architecture. These were well-known architects, uh, and they had a few other commissions during this program as well in other parks. Uh, so the Park Service and the firm had something of a relationship. I don't know much about that relationship, but they had other jobs as well as this one. Uh, and then at Petrified Forest, this was entirely forward-looking. There was a, It was a clean slate site, meaning there was nothing there before. Uh, the interstate was brand new. The lands that, that were now parked um, in the Painted Desert portion of the park were all brand new. So everything about this facility was looking forward. This is the Rainbow Forest Museum before it was added on to in the Mission 66 program. Uh, this would have been the place where the park headquarters was, as well as the only visitor facility in the park for something like 900,000 visitors in the, in the late in the mid 50s. Um, just completely overrun uh, with visitors and um, not people not getting the kind of experience would, they would want to get at a national park, or at least that the park service felt that they should be getting. You can see some petrified wood laying on the ground there. That's because this facility, this is looking out the back door, was sitting right in the middle of the giant logs deposit. So those are all petrified wood logs. The trail goes through all the petrified wood fossils. And it's sitting right there. It's very intimate. It's, it's located right next to the main park resource. You can see that the building was built of stone. Uh, so very rustic and, and um, handmade, it has a handmade feel to it. This is an aerial photograph of the Painted Desert Community Complex and its site. Uh, so to, be, to orient you, we're looking west towards Flagstaff and Los Angeles. To the left then is south, that's where the rest of the park is. That's where the original part of the park is, Rainbow Forest and the 1930s um, era facilities. Interstate 40 is the double lane uh, road that you see on the left side of the photograph. This uh, sort of fainter line that I'm putting the uh, cursor across is Route 66. And then just off to the right of the photograph is the Painted Desert. So we're not too far from the Painted Desert. Uh, this is the Painted Desert Community Complex located right off of I-40. Uh, it, part of its purpose was to intercept visitors as they come into the state. This is on the eastern edge of Arizona, and into the state uh, and introduce them to the National Park Service. Not just Petrified Forest, but to the whole agency. The, uh, this bare spots with the uh, with the lines through them, I think, is a is a graded area where there was a right here in the middle is a is a depression. It was this is a very flat site, and I think that they created a place to drain the parking lots uh, by building a depression there and then spreading the, the spoils out and then uh, putting these erosion controls. I think that's what that is. As you arrive in the parking lot, this is the uh, the first view you have of the facility. Um, the, the wall that's in front of you is the backside of the maintenance facility, but you don't know anything about that. You can't see it from the parking lot. It's just a blank wall with these um, uh, vertical columns supporting this lower section. 
this is a little bit closer view of the site. The, uh, these structures here the, are the single family homes. There's three in this block and then six in this block and six in this block and three in this block. Uh, this is a trailer court for employees. It was always intended for employees, always has been employees, uh, short-term employee uh, housing. And then the, the public functions are over here. Uh, on the left, we'll talk about more, those more in a little bit. This, uh, in the background, this is beginning to be the Painted Desert over here. And this, again, this highlight, or this uh, little um, line you see in, this, in the grasslands is, the, is Route 66. This photograph would have been taken probably in the late 60s. This, this complex was finished in 63, most of it. And, um, my guess based just on the size of the trees is this photograph would have been in the late 60s, maybe 1970. This is the site plan. Uh, it's, it's a bit aspirational because some of the things weren't yet built, uh, but it gives you an idea of how the place was laid out. So coming from the right hand side, you're coming from the freeway, coming to this main parking lot. The flow of, of visitor um, traffic would be through this point right here and on the right would be the visitor center and on the left is the gift shop and restaurant come into this central plaza very very uh, uh pleasing uh place was considered an oasis so this this building that is the uh, gas the uh, gas station and gift shop and restaurant is called the painted desert oasis and the the plaza out front was intended to be an oasis from the desert. There are apartments that face on one side of that plaza, the visitor center on another side, the restaurant and gift shop on the third side, and then an open area on the, on the west, or the northwest, northeast actually. Um, what this drawing uh, shows is the proposed school building that was built uh, it also shows some concession apartments were, which were not built that closed in the uh, central courtyard area. This is the maintenance area here. Uh, and then this is all the housing that we showed on the aerial and the trailer park up here. This, uh, we won't see much of this in the, in the rest of the program because this is the entrance station which no longer exists uh, it, it was built we do have a photograph of it but it hasn't uh, don't know exactly when it was removed and, uh, that's the only building that no longer stands that was, that was built this maybe is a little bit more clear about how the structures and which are structures and which are, are uh, roads and trails so again, the parking lot over here, this is the maintenance building and the maintenance yard. This is a maintenance storage facility. So this is a whole maintenance yard here. This is the visitor center uh, and offices upstairs. This is uh, apartments uh, in this wing. This was the community building, is the community building. This is the school building. Uh, this is the gas station over here, the gift shop and restaurant, all single family homes here and garages at either end. And this would be the court, the uh, trailer court and the trailer court building. That's a support building for the trailer, trailer court. And again, the entrance station over here. One of the geniuses of this facility is the way that all the functions of running a park, which I mentioned were, this is the only place that I know of where all the functions that you need to run a park are in the same, in a, a purpose built facility all at the same time in the same place. Uh, and all those functions are brilliantly separated ar architecturally. So one example, the first example is, as you come into the parking lot, this wall separates the public space of the parking lot from the non-public space of the maintenance yard on the back on the other side. We'll see other examples of that uh, coming up. This is the gas station off the end of the, the Painted Desert Oasis building. 
the entrance uh, from the parking lot. This is the visitor center door. Um, this would be, this is a blank wall, but you go into this space around the corner and the, the entrance to the gift shop and the restaurant are off the plaza. These are offices upstairs. Um, you can see later on, there was a Petrified Forest National Park added to this wall in the same lettering uh, because people began to think that, that the Painted Desert was a separate national park from Petrified Forest. And that, that perception still exists, uh, but it's, it was a, one attempt to correct the record was to put lettering on the wall that said Painted Desert, I mean, uh, Petrified Forest National Park. This is now from the inside of the central plaza. You're looking at the gift shop and the restaurant is off to the right. This would be the glass wall of the visitor center and the balcony uh, that is off the apartments, uh, not the apartments, offices upstairs. These are what we call the spider legs. They're the signature structural elements of this complex. Uh, beams coming off the second floor and uh, running down to the to the plaza supporting the balcony. From inside the visitor center looking out uh, into that central plaza and across to the gift shop. Uh, the parking lot is off here to the left. Again from the central plaza this is the facade of the restaurant uh, gift shop being at the far end here. These are the upstairs offices and the downstairs visitor center. You see the stone planters uh, and these are fiberglass planters, another concrete planter here. This would be the end of the, this concrete planter goes up all the way to the building uh, going to the right marking the end of the walkway uh, and the door uh, going into the restaurant right next to it. Now looking at the other direction from the central plaza from the entrance essentially to the central plaza looking at the apartment wing. Uh, again this is another example where separate uses are right next to each other but very difficult to tell. There are four apartments behind this stone wall. Um, the, this uh, aluminum grating at the top of the wall is a, a vent for the uh, for the apartments. And then up above it is a walkway with an open air uh, space above the railing for, that serves the four apartments on the upstairs. So you'd have residents walking through this hallway uh, and you might see a head go by every once in a while if you're in the plaza but we'd never know that there were ne never necessarily know that there were uh, apartments up there. Uh, from the second level, this is the balcony, the planter, and a, and a bench seat. Uh, apartment, I mean, uh, office windows over here, the spider legs, and the apartment wing on the far end. Uh, spider legs from the other end of the balcony, looking out at the restaurant facade and the gift shop, and the rest of the central plaza. This is the restaurant. Um, Lots of built-in counter seating as well as uh, tables. This is this was a sit-down service restaurant at the time. There were there would have been uh, wait staff to serve people in this restaurant. Um, this is what's called the ceiling of light, and uh, lowered obviously from the rest of it. Um, these separators, these uh, dividers, are uh, aluminum tubes. Would have been. Pretty striking, I think. And looking out from the restaurant into the central plaza, this, this case is the divider between the, the gift shop and the restaurant. This is the what, what, what is called the library on the second level of the office space. Uh, you can look on the left-hand side of the picture and see sliding glass doors that would go out onto a terrace. And this is that terrace with a planter and uh, more of the signature spider legs. This is the second level of the apartment wing as well. So these are the courtyards for the lower level apartments on the backside. 
the ones we saw uh, from the plaza, um, on the lower level behind the stone wall in the plaza have these courtyards on the other side um, up against this employee parking lot. So this is the planter and a plaza that was off the library. This is that on the upper left of the photograph is where that terrace is. And then down below are offices here. And then beyond this wall are the lower level of the apartments and the upper level apartments, obviously above them. The upper level apartments from the other end, this would be the terrace that we saw a little bit ago and the courtyards at the lower level. We're facing southeast, uh, the, those not we are, the, the building is facing southeast. Um, so you can see that, that there's a little bit, it's probably late in the season, meaning the sun is fairly low uh, and it's in the morning. This is an inside of one of those upper level apartments. Uh, Mr. Neutra himself uh, sitting on the couch. It's a two bedroom or a two room apartment. You can see the bedroom in through the door here with the bathroom off, off that. And just to our right, the right of the photographer is where there's a small little kitchenette. This is the, uh, again, the central plaza. This is that stone wall with the apartments uh, behind it. And this is the front of the community building with a big roll up um, metal door, a garage door, huge width. It's probably 20 feet wide, maybe more. That allows that whole space to be opened up to inside outside use. This is the inside of the community building. Um, it can be used for a variety of things. Because there was a school on site, it was used for school presentations. It was used for employee training. It can be used for community uh, get-togethers. Uh, we've, we've had uh, wedding receptions at this facility. Uh, there's all kinds of different uses for this big space. A screen here, a curtain here to be able to, to use it in a variety of different ways. These doors open to the outside. These, these are not the garage door. The garage door is behind the photographer. So it would be, uh, there would be the opportunity to open both ends of the room if you wanted to. This is the school. So the, the community building we were just in is this building here. Uh, this is the school adjacent to it. Um, two classrooms and uh, an office. And that's about it in that facility, that space. These are the. Can I interrupt? Uh, yes, of course. Brad, who who attended the school? Was it only? Were there enough kids of the employees, or were some nearby kids come also? The idea was that it was for uh, employees of the school. And there may have been some other kids, that, depending on circumstances, that might find this was the closest school to them. But the primary purpose was for employees' kids. And those employees lived in these housing units. This is uh, three of the four housing blocks. There's a, this one at the far end is uh, three units. And this one's six and this one's six. They're, they're three wide. So the six blocks are three wide and two deep. Uh, and the three, three unit blocks are just three wide and one deep. Uh, there's one more block off to the left of the photographer that is a three unit uh, block. These, this was the probably the most controversial part of the project from the Park Service's perspective because this is a time when the, all across the country, what the Park, is, Park Service is doing in all the other Mission 66 projects is building ranch style housing in suburban layout um, areas, made it little suburbs. Um, and you know, the thinking, the Park Service thinking culture is Park Service rangers live in cabins uh, and not row houses. And so the, this was a significant departure from the Park Service culture in terms of living conditions for park employees. Uh, but considering all the things that were attempted to be accomplished in this program, meaning housing and offices and visitor facilities and maintenance and community facilities and all those things, 
uh, putting putting them on as small a footprint as possible was uh, what the Neutra Alexander team sold the Park Service eventually. That this was a much more efficient use of space, use of land, uh, and it would it would work better as a unit if the housing was pushed together in row type um, configuration. And for, by my way of thinking, it was the right choice, but it was a significant departure for the Park Service. Um, and it's the only project I know of that was accomplished this way. This is the backside of one of those housing blocks. You can see access into a courtyard. Uh, this space behind this wall, the, between this the, the block wall and the white wall there, uh, that was a service yard where the trash would be and a variety of things that you didn't want uh, your neighbors to see when they came to visit and come into your back door. Uh, so this is the door into the courtyard, which would be a little bit more public, and the uh, service yard, which would be more private. This is the window into the kitchen slash dining room area. This, that's Mr. Neutra himself um, on one of those sidewalks uh, providing access to this courtyard. This is a courtyard in one of those housing units. This is an uh, early photograph of, uh, earlier photograph of one of those um, courtyards. There's a door here, a sliding door in the corner. Uh, these windows are the bedroom units, three bedrooms across, uh, all facing out in the courtyard. And then the, the uh, dining area is right in this corner inside the, inside the unit. The service yard I was mentioning is off to the right of the picture. So this is uh, a more recent photograph of one of those uh, units. This is the only unit that is still has its original configuration. Uh, this the space against this block wall beyond to, to the right of me in the picture is uh, the service yard where the service yard would have been. The divider is gone. Uh, this would this is the dining area and the sliding glass door into the living room, and then the bedrooms uh, windows are off to the left of the photograph. The uh, living room area, you, the light coming from the right would be coming in through that sliding glass door. A kitchen, a typical kitchen. Those are metal cabinets. And this is the entrance station that no longer exists. This is the, uh, the only structure that no longer exists in the, in the complex. Uh, my guess is that it's because uh, of this sign, buses and vehicles over 10 feet. Um, it just, my guess is that visitors, I mean, uh, vehicles just got too big for the station that he chose to take it down. The same thing happened at the gas station, uh, the overhang over the gas station as well. So we'll talk, we'll I'll let you read the, uh, you, the, the visitor to the site, uh, the opportunity to read these about the way it was implemented. There's a lot of information there. Basically, what it resulted in were significant structural problems uh, right at, starting from the very beginning. There were cracks in the walls. Uh, there was poor construction. The contractors did not do what they were supposed to do. There was less than uh, the required steel and grout in the walls. Um, foundations were failing. There was a variety of different problems. But that's been a situation that the Park Service has been dealing with now for the whole life of the complex. There were significant changes made to the structure over time. Uh, again, I won't detail these and uh, I won't go through these in detail, but you'll see in the photographs that we're about to show uh, that there were significant changes made. So the administrative history, um, by 1993, there were so many problems with this facility uh, and the Park Service uh, just did not embrace it anymore and decided that uh, it was best to tear it down and start over. So that was done, that decision was made in 1993 in the general management plan. By 2004, when that hadn't happened and uh, didn't appear to, there didn't appear to be prospects for that to happen, 
uh, the, decide, the Park Service decided that, well, we're going to need to fix the place up and use it for another 50 years. So let's, we're going to change our minds and we're going to dedicate our resources to fixing it up. Uh, so in 2005, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So here's where we go into the uh, then and now pictures. Uh, Raymond, did you want to um, have a discussion? Yes, I wanted to um, ask. So you uh, uh, came on site as superintendent uh, at what year? In 2011, but I had I had I was a project manager in the Phoenix office in 20, 2009 and 10. And uh, I got to work on this pro this facility during that time as well. Uh huh. And uh, just tell us a little bit of your history in the Park Service prior to that. Well, I started in Yellowstone when I was straight out of college um, as a surveyor. Um, I decided to go back to school in historic preservation, actually. Uh, but wasn't able to fund that degree. So I didn't ever get that degree. I came back to the Park Service in 1981, again, back to Yellowstone. And I decided at that point that I would just get my historic preservation fix by working on various facilities inside the agency, that I could, I could do historic preservation in the Park Service. So although my background is as an engineer, uh, my interest has been historic preservation from a lot for a long time. How did that happen? What, uh, why did why would you have gotten interested in that? What in your background? You know, I don't know that there is anything that I can point to other than when I began to first get excited about it. I had taken a trip after I left Yellowstone the first time in 1979. I, I drove I'm, I'm 22 or 23 years old or something. So I, I drove across southern part of the country I'd never been to before. And I went to New Orleans and I went to Savannah, Georgia, and I went to Charleston, South Carolina, and I, I just fell in love with the buildings in these places and decided that historic preservation was something that I really wanted to get into. But at that time, I already had my engineering degree and I, I was not going to, well, I, I tried to go back to school for it and, and uh, didn't, wasn't able to afford it. So I decided I would have to figure out how to get involved in that um, through other means. And so you were involved in, in some other projects in historic restoration within the Park Service, such as? Well, the, the only one that I had much hope for was the, the uh, village, the, the historic village of Grand Canyon, uh, the Grand Canyon Village. Uh, I worked on the master plan for that park in, in the early 90s, from 91 to 95. And that project, that plan called for the, the rehabilitation of many of the old buildings in the village. Um, they're built in the 20s and 30s. They're the, they're the rustic structures. Uh, and we had all kinds of plans for ways that those could be more, they were being used as warehouses at, at that time. Uh, and there were, there were terrific buildings and they could be used for something much better than that. Um, still hasn't happened, but uh, that was my hope was that we would be able to, to make better use of those, those structures in Grand Canyon Village. When I went to, I was so, superintendent at Tonto National Monument as well. And that was also a Mission 66 Visitor Center I was able to make a few small changes. It's a very small park and a small building. Made some changes to restore the intent of that visitor center as well. So, uh, how did it? How did the uh, painted desert land on your desk in Phoenix? You know, I was the uh, acting superintendent at Petrified Forest in 2007 for six months. And that is when I learned about this complex. I did not know, I knew that it was a different kind of place before and I knew that it was falling apart, uh, but I didn't understand it until I went to work there in 2007. And I got the drawings out and I got the historic structure report out and I read them cover to cover. And I just decided, man, this is a great, con a, a great challenge 
and I want to be part of it. So that's from from that time forward, um, I had the opportunity. I applied for the for the position then in 2007, uh, superintendent didn't get it. Uh, went to Phoenix in 2009 and started working on the facility from Phoenix, and then applied for the job again and got it in 2011. So the reason that I ask you this is because I too had a career in a bureaucracy. I worked for 30 years in the California Department of Public Health. And I know that nowadays people think that uh, people that work in government are faceless bureaucrats that sort of mumble along. And uh, I know that, it, that working in a bureaucracy is an opportunity for dedicated and creative people and I just wanted to uh, put a human face on all the work that you subsequently did. Right yeah thank you yeah it's this became a passion of mine and, and you know, there were other there were other attractions at Petrified Forest as well I mean there's additional lands being acquired and and a concession contract that hadn't had an opportunity for change in 40 years so there were other things that gave me an opportunity to, to um, shape this park uh, during the time that I was there. But this complex was what attracted me to, this, to the place in the first place. Uh, just one other thing. So yes. you have a family that, that lived there? Or what was the composition of your family? Did you live in one of those, uh, one of those patio places? Um, my wife and I are constitute our family. We don't have any kids or pets, so we're uh, we're pretty uh, footloose. Um, we, I lived in a a trailer in the trailer court when I was working there. Um, I chose to do that because I didn't want the superintendent to be taking up housing that other people would need. Housing is very tight there, and. Uh, the trailer court is one of the least desirable places. I, I chose to live there uh, and, and it worked out fine. I, I, I enjoyed it. But uh, I, that, by doing that, I left uh, other housing units available for staff. And is, does your wife, did your wife work in the, um, in the park service too or? She did briefly, that's where we met. We met, uh, she was a ranger at Grand Canyon when, I, when we both worked at Grand Canyon. Um, she, since um, does not work for the Park Service, but she has uh, worked with the Park Service. She still manages the website for the uh, Petrified Forest Museum Association, uh, and she does the websites of other uh, Park Service uh, associations as well. So she's, she's able to work remotely, and, and she would work from our home uh, while I was working out of the trailer court in the, at the park during the time that we worked there. Okay, proceed. All right, so uh, we're, the next series of slides is about the changes that have been made, uh, both the negative ones that were made and the what we hope are positive uh, corrections that have been made in recent years. So the, this is the entrance, obviously, and the space between the, the two buildings is where you get into the central plaza again. Uh, what you see in this photograph are a couple of things. The one on the bottom, the roof was added in 1989, extends over the spider legs. So where in the upper photograph, you can see the spider legs, they're very defined against the sky. Here with the roof being on top of them, you don't get that sense at all. They just look like structural members holding up the roof, which they're actually barely doing. Uh, but they're also, the, the paint is new, the windows have been uh, replaced. Uh, so there, this is, uh, has been restuccoed and re-roofed. So there are some things that have been modified. Here, here you see the, uh, this is the door to the restrooms that were, um, they're accessible from the parking lot. Um, we were able to leave them open 24 seven. When, when we close the visitor center, we can still leave the restrooms open as long as we don't get uh, vandalism and uh, we didn't for the time that I was there. From the central plaza, so this is the original photograph at the top on the left is the photograph uh, before we began our work. So this would have been, well, the, the storefront here was closed in in, in the 
1980s. The uh, brown and brown, light brown on dark brown or whatever paint is, uh, was done in the 70s. And you can see here that the most recent photograph, the storefront has been restored. The paint colors white on the stucco here and red on the, on the facing here and steel, um, kind of an aluminum silver color on the steel. Those are the original colors that have been restored. We still have to get the roof off, but uh, there have been some improvements, what I hope are improvements. So the, again, the front of the Oasis building, you see the framed in uh, wall. To, this was, I presume was to save money on energy because the, the technology for the glass storefronts in the 60s uh, was not particularly energy efficient. These, uh, this is a 2018 or 2017 technology on the front now that's significantly better than it would have otherwise been or would have been in the 60s. Yeah, that's that's the only thing to point out on that slide. So now we're in the looking the other direction, our courtyard, and um, this bench in the top right was added before we took this picture. There wasn't one for many years. Put that back in place, but you can see the colors haven't changed yet. And down here, the colors have changed. The bench is still there. Uh, you can see that in this upper photograph, maybe you can't see, but the next photograph will, will show it a little better. This was open air when it was first built in 1963. Um, it's now glass. This is, these are new windows here. Uh, this shows better that that's a gl glass enclosed walkway. And this is, I think this picture is from 1968. Uh, Raymond, you took this one, is this 68? Uh, somewhere between 66 and 68, probably 67, I think. Okay, 67. It, from our records, it shows that this was enclosed after the first winter. So in 1964, we have a photograph showing the, the glass enclosure. So my suspicion is that snow blew in there and it was difficult to get out. This is um, the upper level, the balcony. We restored the planter and the bench seat before and the uh, tread on the balcony before this photograph was taken. This was in 2012, so the photograph would have been from 13 or 14. Again, the, the colors have not changed yet up there. Now with the, you can't see the planter very well, but it is still there and the colors have been modified. The, uh, by the way, this tree is the same tree that, that this is down here in the courtyard 50 years later. The, the main difference between these two anymore now is just that the roof is covering the spider legs in the, in the current uh, photograph. Restaurant. Um, so over the years, obviously the, the original restaurant is entirely gone. The only thing left uh, is the ceiling of light and this uh, upper ceiling has been dropped. You can tell the difference between the two-step um, step um, structure here uh, and only a small portion of it is showing up here. We took the ceiling back to its original height, put new tiles in it. Uh, when we put fire protection in, this is a fire sprinkler, and when we put the uh, storefront on, we needed to make sure the ceiling was back to its original height because otherwise it would show attic space in there. So at least the ceiling portion is restored. Uh, the rest of the restaurant uh, requires significant uh, restoration still. This is the library. Uh, the, the tables are the same tables from 50 years ago. Uh, the difference being that at this left-hand side, you can see the glass and on the going out to the terrace. That's now a wall going into an office space. So we'll see in a second uh, the other changes, but this. Uh, the other the other thing is that the block wall was exposed here behind the books and there's been a little bit of drywall added um, behind the or in front of the block. This is that terrace with the planter and uh, that terrace is entirely enclosed. This is the wall that holds the, that uh, encloses the offices that are there now, courtyards below for the uh, apartments. 
again, the terrace that's been closed in with offices upstairs. Uh, these, I believe this is taken after the windows were replaced. That was one of the biggest challenges that we had to think through is what, how, how do we deal with the windows, the original 1960s windows were very thermally inefficient. Uh, we were able to find a window, double pane window that had the exact same configuration other than the depth that's required for the double pane. Uh, and it, it hits beautifully. It, it really, uh, you would never know that there is a more efficient window in place of those 1960s windows. This is the upper level of the apartment wing. You can see that it, on the upper level, one apartment, this is one two room apartment was framed in. There were two, three more on the lower level that were framed in. Um, and we've, at least on the upper level, we've been able to restore the, uh, the glass ribbon of windows. Uh, and this photograph also shows the original paint colors restored to these uh, courtyard walls, courtyard doors. The school building, a little hard to see in this photograph, but this classroom at the far end was uh, framed in, no more glass. Uh, we restored that with, in this photograph and restored the colors as well, the tur turquoise and white. There's a dark brown stripe across the top up here. Those were uh, original colors for the school. Now, the, these are no longer used as a school, right? That's correct, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. It's uh, uh, these, the, the school only lasted about 10 years. Um, the, when, when this was framed in, it was framed in to be a community library. It was a county uh, outlet for the county library at one time, and that went away as well. Uh, so now these, this is actually the, where the museum collection is for the Park Service, uh, the Parks Museum collection where all the fossils are kept and the pots and arrowheads and things that, that, uh, that are in our museum collection are held in this building. Uh, this is the community building, um, not changed very much. We we'll talked a little bit about the structure of this wall. The, uh, the, the floor was significantly cracked and this wall was in uh, pretty bad shape. Uh, in 20, 2009, we, we began the re rehab of that. But otherwise it looks pretty similar. Housing um, has been significantly modified. This is one unit, the one that we saw from the outside a little bit ago. Uh, that uh, is in pretty original condition. You, the, the walls have been painted in some cases. Uh, we took, we took uh, insulation and paneling off in order to get this photograph. Uh, so it's not entirely um, pristine, but it is something to work with. We're, we've tried a variety of options of getting the paint off of this block, either trying to get it off or trying to cover it with something that'll be close to this. It's one of the challenges. The kitchen, um, there, are, there are some of units that still have these metal cabinets. Most of the ones that are occupied, which are all but three of the 18 units are, are occupied as housing or office space. There's some of them, there are a couple of them are offices, um, but most of them are occupied the three that are not occupied still have some of these metal cabinets. Before, oh, we, get on to, before we get on to that, Brad. Yep. Um, so uh, my dad and Bob Alexander uh, were pushing people into a, a different style of living than would have been traditional. And uh, looking at the images of the, of the patios, they seem pretty bare to me. Uh, uh, um, and I'd like you to, before when we talked about this, you mentioned that some people grumble at being forced to live in a way that they would, instead of the ranch house that they would be used to. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, and others embrace it. Can you talk a little bit about those who've embraced it how have they? How do they use the space? And and uh, and particularly, how do they deal with this little courtyard that they have, which is different than the challenge of maybe keeping up a a, a lawn or something? 
Well, I lived in housing in Crown Point, New Mexico, with the Indian Health Service about 100 miles to the east of Painted Desert. Around the time that that picture of my dad in the, the snow was there, we came over right. to look at it. And, uh, you know, there was, we watered the lawn and there was a chain link fence and that was our outdoors that we saw mm -hmm. when we came out the door. Right. But how do people use, uh, uh, has anyone creatively used those patios? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the people that are into it have, uh, it's a, it's a space that is small enough that you, even if you're only planning to be a petrified forest for a short time, you know, if you, if you're, your goal is to move on in a few years, which happens in the park service all the time. Uh, it's not a big investment to just um, do whatever you, whatever feels good to you. And with, whether it's uh, planting a garden, um, flowers, um, uh, doing some hardscaping with stone or, or block. Um, there's a variety of people have done a variety of interesting things with that, with those spaces. Uh, when they decide that they're going to embrace it. And others have, have uh, there's a lawnmower that the park lends out for people to lawn, mow their lawn if they choose to uh, grow grass in there. So there, there are a variety of different things. Uh, people have, you know, they, they'll grow their vegetables back there. They will um, just, if they've got a tree in the backyard, they might just create a nice little sitting spot. Uh, there's a variety of different things people have chosen to do with those backyards. That's an interesting point that I hadn't yeah. thought of, that the nature of the inhabitants are that they don't stay there long. And so yeah, they have a kind of a privacy to do what they want to do that they wouldn't have in the more suburban, uh, um, larger space and more public space. True. Absolutely. It's, it, if you're going to landscape your, your suburban backyard, it's a bigger effort than if you're going to uh, landscape your small courtyard uh, off of one of these houses. So, uh, and it's it's a much more intimate space, uh, more private space. Uh, so for people that that embrace that, it, they've they've loved it. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, there are a few people who who don't like it and and uh, feel like they are trapped inside because the walls are so high and and uh, you can't see anybody. But but uh, it, it's a it's a it's entirely dependent on personal taste. Can you also say something about uh, the use of that community space and, and what kind of community things happen in that courtyard, if, if there's a big courtyard in front of the restaurant? That space is, uh, so let's, uh, well, it's quite a ways back. I don't think I'll go back on the slides. Uh, the central, the, the space where the, all the photographs were taken from, wh which is surrounded by the buildings, uh, that is mostly just a circulation space. We, we, there's not a lot of activities that occur there. Um, we have some picnic tables towards the, towards the far end of the, of the um, apartment wing and some shade there so people can, can um, have their lunch outside that's that has become popular uh, and then in the larger uh, common space that is between the housing units and the central plaza that larger um, outdoor plaza space that is an interpretive loop where people can walk in a, in a short little loop and see interpretive signs about what the park's all about you know you can, if you go here, you can learn about paleontology. If you go here, you can learn about archaeology, those kinds of things. Uh, so it's an introduction to the park. This is, this facility is outside the entrance station. So you have not, if you're visiting here, you have not yet paid your entrance fee. You're not a park visitor yet. You're probably more likely to be a freeway traveler uh, and just getting back on the road than getting, coming into the park. So part of our, our goal is to entice you to come into the park. And that's what we do with that, that larger central spot, central space, is to you know, um, give people a sense of what there is to see in the park. And you can't see anything from the, you can't see the painted desert, you can't see petrified wood, you can't see anything from the complex. Um, but our, our challenge is to uh, 
explain to people what it is that Petrified Forest is all about and, and try to get them interested in. So that's what we do. Now, with regard to community life, uh, what was uh, Halloween like at this complex? Um, when I was there, we have very few kids. So there's, it, it was just like any other night, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Most people with kids, because there's, the, the school isn't there anymore, uh, most people with kids do not live in the complex. There are a couple kids there, uh, but like, I mean, literally two. Uh, for most of the time that I was there. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a very, um, it's not family oriented necessarily anymore. It's more um, seasonal employees take the place over in the summer. Uh, there are probably, I don't know, 40 uh, seasonal employees who live in those housing units in the summertime. And there's uh, maybe 18 to 20 a permanent full-time year-round residents there, um, but not a lot of, you know, like I said, almost no kids. So it's it's um, it's a it's a work site more than it is a community anymore. Uh -huh. What are all these 40 uh, seasonal people doing? Oh, all kinds of things. We have. Um, a big science program. So we have archaeologists and paleontologists and uh, uh, biologists who come and, and work in the summer season getting uh, field work done. We have uh, people who, who give programs and staff the front desks who uh, interact with the public. Uh, season is, uh, summer season is the busiest time of the year. So it's, it's where you know, we have when I was there, we had anywhere from 600 to 800,000 visitors a year. And uh, most of them would come to this facility. So there would be lots of things that um, we need to, you know, questions we need to answer and, and information to impart to them. Um, there would be a few maintenance uh, workers as well, maybe some special projects that we've got going on where we have additional staff. Uh, trail projects, for example, where, where we don't hire those projects out, we do them in house. And so we need to hire seasonal uh, trail crew staff. So there's uh, summer is when the work gets done. And that's when we have to bring in the uh, extra hands. Would some of the people that are working there uh, occasionally use that restaurant? Or is it really only guests, the travelers? No, there, every day there would be somebody in there, uh, staff having, having lunch um, in, the, in the restaurant. Um, pretty much every day there'd be somebody in there having, having lunch, yeah. And more often than not, it'd be more than one person. Great, well, thank you for giving us a little glimpse of, of life in this complex. For the, yeah, for the work bit. So go ahead now, National Treasure. All right, so in, I mentioned that I arrived there in 2011 and early on tried to figure out who I could partner with to try and make some progress on restoration of this complex and what needed to be done. So I reached out to the National Trust for Historic Preservation first and they, they were interested and they, um, be, we began talking and it resulted in a partnership between the Park Service, between actually Petrified Forest and the Trust uh, between 2014 and 2016, the two-year partnership, uh, where the, the trust declared this, this complex a national treasure. One of the, well, it's a trust designation. It's not a national uh, federal designation, but it raises the profile. It explains to the public that this is something worth protecting. And we were able to involve other local community, local uh, preservation organizations too, like Modern Phoenix, Arizona Preservation Foundation, the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation, all were integral in working on uh, trying to uh, raise the profile of this complex and get people interested in, in trying to fix it up. One of the, th we, we, the three of uh, the, the group of us who, who, um, got together and put together a strategy for how to move forward, included getting the facility listed as a National Historic Landmark as one of our 
goals. And that goal was accomplished in 2016 uh, when the official designation was made. Who made the actual uh, 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 the documentation to the Park Service for this landmark status? Um, Front Range Research Associates uh, was a contractor that we hired to put the paperwork together and, and get that uh, process or get that um, request submitted, uh, we, which they did during 2016. And, and it was it was designated in December of, of 2016, just before um, Secretary Jewell left office. Uh, I uh, prepared the similar documentation for the Neutra uh, VDL studio and residences, so I know how much work that is. It is a lot of work, indeed. Um, yes. uh, you and I talked uh, before about the fact that another part of the Park Service uh, a little bit earlier had torn down another visitor center that my uh, Neutra and Alexander designed at Gettysburg. And you explained that uh, there are different regions and that the initiative of the park superintendent there was, he was hostile to the thing and that there was really no sort of connection or influence about these two decisions that they just happened in different parts of the bureaucracy and didn't represent any overarching policy. No, that, they absolutely don't represent any overarching policy. So it's, the Park Service can be in some ways pretty decentralized, meaning that superintendents do have a certain amount of, of uh, autonomy to be able to make decisions. Uh, the bigger decisions have to be approved by the regional director. And my regional director was in Denver. The regional director for Gettysburg is probably in either Philadelphia or Washington. I'm not, I don't remember exactly which. Uh, but the, the Gettysburg situation w is slightly different because, well, that superintendent has to cons be concerned about those siting. And the, the decision, as I understood his decision, he decided that the, the site that the building was on was more important to the, to the Gettysburg uh, battlefield than it was in and of itself as a, as an important structure. And that doesn't mean it wasn't an important structure, but he had a conflict between the building and its site. Uh, in this case, it's no, it's not, not anywhere similar um, at Petrified Forest. It's just a facility that needs to be rehabbed. Right. Um, so it's, it was a, it was a more complex decision for him. Right. And it's interesting that when the decision was to build the uh, visitor center on Gettysburg, it, it also housed this big panoramic uh, 19th century painting of the site. And they, they placed it there, I think, because the view in that panorama, which went all the way around you, was exactly the same view, and so you'd get up. And then my father told the story of when he learned of getting that commission. He was driving around, I think, somewhere in Texas with a southerner who expressed his feeling that this was a celebration of the defeat of the Confederacy, which he had bad feelings about. And so my father decided that he would try to add a programmatic feature where there would be a celebration, not so much of the victory, but of uh, Lincoln's address at Gettysburg, and uh, that there would be annually a, a talk about peace that would occur there. And he Interesting. Had, had a big opening and a whole place where all these people would come and so forth. Mm -hmm. And just as in the Painted Desert where he was pushing the envelope about what people were used to, uh, he was doing it there too yep. uh, without success. And so ultimately the people who wanted to reenact the battle found it irritating to see this modernist building mm -hmm. right in the middle of the battle where they wanted to dress up in gray and blue and right. shoot at each other. 
right. so right, right. it was t torn down. <laughs> the, the, the thing was moved into the, the panorama was moved into the Gettysburg. Interesting. I, that, that's an interesting story. I hadn't heard that. Yep. So go ahead. All right. So uh, we we got the de uh, historic landmark um, designation. Um, there are challenges that still have remained. Um, soils and foundations are the biggest one. Uh, and I mentioned that there were challenges right from the start. Uh, there, there have been structural analyses done on average about every 10 years since the 60s. The most recent one is 2009, which I was actually a part of. I, I was uh, the project manager for that project. Um, so there was very little actually done. There were soil, there were structural uh, analyses and, and there was a basic understanding of what needed to be done, but there wasn't a lot done. There, there was some uh, grout injection underneath some of the apartment units or some of the uh, housing units in the 70s. But that's, about, that's all I know of that was an attempt to st structurally stabilize the building. So uh, since 2011, what we have, some of the things that we've done, uh, stabilized the community building foundation in 2010 uh, I said since 2011. This was one I worked on when I was still in Phoenix. The Visitor Center Administration Building uh, Foundation in 2014 and 15 and Housing Block A in 15 and 16. Uh, so there's plenty more to do in terms of the stabilization of foundations, but at least those that represents the highest priority. The first two, the Community Building and the Visitor Center, are the, the only two-story masonry walls in the complex and they were not, uh, they, they were structurally um, challenging, meaning the structural engineers were pretty worried about them. So that's why they were our top priority. Uh, some of the other projects we worked on, the, the seating and balcony planter on the balcony upstairs uh, of the visitor center building, the school facade, in 2012, uh, new heating and cooling in the administration building. And the cooling was a central air conditioning, which allowed us then to take all the window air conditioners out of the windows and be able to um, restore the windows. So that, that was a, there was strategy behind the timing of that. Uh, fire suppression and original restoration of the ceiling in the Oasis building, and the, that's the restaurant and gift shop in 2015 uh, partial window replacement in the administration building that's you know after the after the air conditioner has been removed in 2015 we did add solar power to the community building and the school uh, in a, on a separate an array that is separate from all the buildings uh, but it provides 100 percent of the power for the community built community building and the school um, all year round we had a hope crew this is a um, hands-on preservation experience, that's what HOPE stands for. Uh, restore, this is a National Trust for Historic Preservation program. Uh, so their crew restored the original colors to the plaza area in 2015. Uh, we restored the glass storefront in 2016 and 17. That project was funded by the National, by the American Express Foundation. They provide the funding to the National Trust and the National Trust gave the funding to us to work on that project. So it was a direct, uh, a direct result of our partnership with the National Trust that that uh, storefront was restored. It was part of the Park Service Centennial. So 2016 was the Park Service Centennial and there was a big funding program to match um, grants that would be provided by the private sector. And so this was one of those projects that was funded in part by Centennial funding and the other part by the American Express Foundation through the National Trust. And uh, last thing we, we worked on before I left was the restoration of the second floor facades on the apartment wing in, in 2018. So the, some of the structural uh, elements, the helical piers were used on the community building. Uh, that's just a foundation stabilization method. 
Micropiles are another stabilization method. They were used on the visitor center building. And the only reason that we used one on one building and one on the other is we had different structural engineers. Uh, both of them have, have worked just fine. This is a topo map, topo map of the slab, the concrete slab of the visitor center building. Uh, usually you wouldn't expect a topo map of a slab. It's usually supposed to be flat, but there's three and a half inches difference in this slab. Uh, this is a raised portion. This is the two-story wall on the right-hand side of this floor plan. Uh, and that's the one that was failing, uh, creating this buckle in the, in, the, in the floor. So we took the slab out and uh, re redid its, its subsurface and restored it. The wall on the right-hand side of these photographs is that two-story block wall that is, has now been stabilized. The upper two pictures here are of, restore, of the windows being replaced and the uh, original color being restored to the, to the uh, facade of the upstairs uh, offices in the visitor center building. The lower two photographs are the uh, walkway in the, hall, the, the hallway of the apartment wing upstairs. This is taken when the, the 1964 windows had been taken out and the uh, new ones were about to be installed. That were, the, the 64 windows leaked terribly, the water and, and energy. So we uh, were able to put new ones in that didn't leak either as badly. This is the uh, color uh, restoration project, the Hope Crew. Uh, they, they painted all the uh, stucco surfaces white. And the, uh, this is, there was research done into what the original color was. And this is a, an exact color match for the facade of this balcony. This is the, uh, the ceiling of the uh, balcony upstairs. This is, in fact, you can see it in this photograph. It's still brown in this photograph, light brown, and it's white in this photograph. This is uh, apartment A after the foundation stabilization has been done. Uh, part of the stabilization work is to get water away from the foundation and on a very flat site, it's not as easy to do as you would hope. Um, this drainage ditch uh, accomplishes that for the future. This front slab was entirely replaced and all of these are, are new. This is the storefront work. Uh, you can see the original columns and uh, this is the outside. This is the inside. So this is where the, the store, this is a temporary wall and on the left hand side of this right hand photograph, the wall is going to go right here behind the, there it is right there, it's right behind the columns. And that's what it looked like on the right after the work was done. And you can also see that the, the uh, ceiling had to be raised before this storefront was installed because the part of the, the, uh, the visual, um, what the architect was trying to do was create a space that was as transparent between in, indoor and outdoor as possible. We were not able to recess that upper channel as much as it was originally. So it loses a little bit of that, um, that effect, but um, it is pretty close. It's pretty close. So um, getting to the end here, planned projects. Um, there are, there's lots more to do. So in the Oasis building, that is the restaurant, gift shop, gas station, um, take the pitch metal roof off, restore the gas station canopy, and restore the diner configuration to the restaurant. Uh, repairing block walls and concrete floors and, and utilities. And the utilities uh, bring them up to standard that'll last another 50 years. And reorganize the back of the house for modern uses. So places that are not public uh, are in great need of, of upgrade to make them more uh, useful for current uses. Um, and this note at the bottom is, is some of the best news we have for this project. The Great American Outdoors Act that was just signed into law this summer is the best chance in decades to get this work funded. These, the projects I'm describing here in the planned portion are 
are in the Park Service request project request system. They have been requested and the Great American Outdoors Act will give them the best chance we've had in a long time of getting funded. And we estimated they were about, I want to say about $20 million when I left the, uh, a year and a half ago. Um, I don't know how they've been modified since, but I expect that they're probably still in the same general ballpark. Now, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I have a question after. Finish. Okay, there's two, two more of these. Uh, so the, the, the first one was the Oasis building. This is the visitor center building and the maintenance shops. Again, take the uh, pitched metal roof off, restore the terrace off the library, um, restore the maintenance shop facade. Again, repair block walls and utilities, stabilize the foundation, and bring the building up to fire codes and accessibility codes. And lastly, the housing blocks. We've, we've pretty much done the exterior of housing A, housing block A, but we're still B, C, and D left to be done. That is roofs, uh, block walls, stucco overhangs, foundations, um, drainage, fire suppression, and landscaping. So oh, that's that there is hope that those things, those last three things can be done now that there's uh, dedicated funding to facility work in the park service. Great. Now, um, so this will, if the money comes, this, uh, the, the superintendent will uh, be responsible in the way that you were. Um, if the superintendent doesn't have the kind of engineering skill that, that you have, how will, the, um, how will the park service make sure that, that that's available to do it? Well, this, the, the funding that we're talking about in this, in this Great American Outdoors Act is enormous compared to the park service's normal funding. So for example, my understanding is that the, the, the bill allows $900 million per year to, to be allocated to the construction of, you know, to, to the maintenance backlog is, is the way it's described uh, in the park service. And the normal construction budget is about a million, and, I mean, 150 million, 160 million, 170 million. Uh, it varies from year to year. Uh, so it's a multifold increase in the amount of money that is available for facility work. So the Park Service will have a significant challenge in coming up with the way to manage that money. And whoever, I would be shocked if there were not a project manager assigned who knows historic preservation and knows how to get a project done uh, to help the superintendent get through this. That's, that has to be the way it works, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, we've heard a story about a particular place, and this is the first of a series of webinars uh, that the Notre Institute for Survival Through Design will be hosting about successful restoration projects, both of residential and non-residential work. And um, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, large organizations like the Park Service or the ones that are responsible for uh, university buildings that Neutra designed or civic buildings that Neutra designed, that there are uh, established ways of doing things, but it makes a big difference to have a champion who wants to use uh, those procedures and skillfully uh, work around those procedures to get the job done. And uh, I think this is an inspiring story. It's a story of uh, cooperation between the National Trust for Historic Preservation and in the Park Service to uh, preserve uh, a really interesting idea that unfortunately because of uh, contractor shortfall uh, was crumbling right from the beginning. And uh, uh, so I think it's a really interesting story and I thank you for taking the time for pulling it together, Brad. It's been my pleasure, um, Raymond. I've, I've enjoyed the, working on this facility for years, and I, I hope actually that I'll 
stay involved in it in one way or another because it's it's something that needs to be preserved uh, not just for its architectural value but because petrified forest needs that kind of a facility to continue to operate so it's it's um, it's my baby I like I like working on it yeah, okay. thank, thank you for asking me to do this okay thank you